we will go to a second round of questions now, and I'm going to start out recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Menarvik, you have a, uh, in the slides that you um, showed the committee here, you had something in regards to global population. And so my question for you is, if we decrease American demand, will oil demand go down on a global scale? I don't know if we have the capability to bring that up or you could just speak to it if you choose to. Yeah, I, mean, I thought that was an interesting slide that, um, so if we decrease American demand for oil, is global demand um, um, going to go down? You know, I think the, um, we have done a lot. Actually, if you look at this per person um, use of oil per year, that's the US, 22 barrels a person per year. That's gone down over time as we got more efficient with our, our automobiles, we got more efficient with our, our heating, we use less oil for heating and other things. Um, Sorry to interrupt, but do you know like, like 50 years ago, do you know what that number was? I, I have that number, but I'm not aware exactly what it is. Yeah, okay, no problem. Maybe in the 30s, I would say in, about in the 30s. So we've worked it down. But I think we're somewhat at a limit of that. And, you know, we only have 350 million people in this country, so you do the math. And the key thing is the drivers is the China, India, Africa block. Four billion people. You know, as India, Africa, and China move towards that global average, we estimate that if they got to the global average, that it would require about 30 million barrels a day, incremental from where we are, just to get to the average. And I'm assured that China's not gonna stop at the, in, the world average. So, you know, that's the driver of world demand. U.S. will have some impact on it, but net, it's all about these three regions. You know, we talk about um, the global picture. Haven't we become uh, more dependent, shall we say, over the barrel to, like, the Saudis once again, which um, with the um, advent of fracking and the technologies that we've had, I mean, we got ourselves energy independence. Um, it seems to me we're moving in the opposite direction now in the last couple of years. Do you agree with that? No, what, the other way? Yeah, that one. Yeah, so this plot right here shows world oil demand, and you can see the, the shaded, the tan color shows the percentage of oil demand that was provided by shale. I mean, this is an amazing gift to America. Both shale oil and shale gas, which is not represented here, has helped to keep our, keep our energy costs at the lowest level in the world. And these 8 million or 10 million barrels a day that that shale oil discovery has led has really been a huge driver for a positive economy over the last 12 years. You know, it got us out of the recession. It helped balance that increase in concerns about peak oil that we were reaching in 2007, 2008. But that's, that production is stabilized now. It's not likely to increase substantially from the point it's at now. It's not going to go down a lot, probably, but we're not going to see that same growth. So I agree with your question that so there is more exposure. So we're still going to need to produce oil from the Gulf and, um, to be able to meet the demand f uh, both for our country and for the world. Yeah, that's, that's correct. And what, what I think we should focus on, if we want to really change and, and look at alternatives, we should first reduce demand. The, the, the movement to reduce supply doesn't impact demand until prices go up. And so I really struggle with understanding why the Biden administration is, is restricting lease sales, restricting activity in the Gulf of Mexico, which is the best environmental barrel that we can produce, in order to reduce supply. So I would just uh, close by saying this, um, in regards to the questioning and comments we just heard on the minority side, um, experts have been predicting for decades that we would see these, uh, for a long time, for decades, that we would see these um, uh, rising global temperatures that are a sure sign that man is causing climate change. That is not correct. In 1975, I have the copy of Newsweek magazine where Paul Ehrlich said that global cooling is the threat to the world, that we were going to lose millions of people by the year 2000 as a result of temperatures cooling on a global scale. Well, now we hear 
We're here, what, 50 years later, almost 50 years later, and it's going to be higher temperatures that are going to, caused by man, that are going to um, make this happen. And by the way, the heat waves that we're having at this point, I think some people forget the 1930s and the Dust Bowl. Go back and look at that temperature data. Those were higher temperatures at that point. And to say that this is all caused by man is at the heart of the green fantasy, and it is nothing but that, but a fantasy. I want to recognize a gentleman from Montana for five minutes.